Hello everyone, this is our final lecture for Chapter 6 on Unemployment. And in this Lecture 4, we're going to talk about why is there unemployment, Part 2. And particularly, we're going to talk about this institutional structure and sectoral shifts. And I, I know back in the very first lecture, we talked about this idea of institutional structure being important to uh, uh, this determination of the underlying unemployment rate or the natural rate of unemployment. And we kind of were a little wibbly wobbly as, ex as exactly what institutional structure means. So we're going to do that. We're going to go into a little more detail in this lecture about what exactly we mean by institutional structure and what we mean by structural shifts and what are some of the policy responses for these. So let's return to our definition of structural unemployment. Structural unemployment occurs when, due to either the institutional structure of an economy or a structural change in the economy, there is a mismatch between available jobs and workers. Okay, this is a little bit of a departure from the way your textbook defines it. I define this, as I said before, a little differently than the textbook. In particular, I consider this, this part here, this structural change, as a cause of structural unemployment and not a cause of frictional unemployment. The reason the main reason for that is its permanency. All right? And in both cases, due to either this institutional structure or the structural change, there is a mismatch between the available jobs and the available workers. This doesn't have anything to do with the job search. These workers can be searching for jobs all they want to. All right? They can have as long as they want to, perfect information, it doesn't matter. There are no available jobs that fit those workers' skills. So there's a fundamental mismatch. Now, a lot of people are thinking that today, one of the reasons why unemployment in the United States is so stubbornly high um, is because there's a lot of structural unemployment, particularly because we're going through a lot of change, and the, the, the economy is changing very rapidly now. It's been speeding up how fast it's changing, and now it's changing just at a lightning pace. And the kinds of skills needed for moderate, moderately skilled, moderately paid jobs, all right, that middle, middle of the road, I'm not talking about the high end, um, takes an advanced degree and 10 years of school to go through, and I'm not talking about the low end that you need no education for. I'm talking about the middle level skilled jobs. There's a major shortage of those, but there isn't a shortage of jobs. There's plenty of jobs and there's plenty of workers, there's just not enough workers who have the training to do the jobs that are available. This we all refer to as structural unemployment, this mismatch. And that's the real key to what structural unemployment is. There's a mismatch between the available jobs and the available workers. So here's a quote from the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis from back in 2010. Firms have jobs, but can't find appropriate workers. The workers that want to work, but can't find appropriate jobs. There's just a mismatch. So let's break that definition down into two different into the two different parts. The first one is institutional structure. Now I know we've talked about this. They said, "What the heck is institutional structure of the economy?" Well, the institutional structure of the economy is essentially the system of rules, formal and informal, that regulate economic activity. So I'll give you an example. Um, in, um, if you play poker, all right, there's a practice called check and raise. All right, you can, you, everybody bets, but if you don't want to bet, and no one's bet yet, you can, what's said, check. In other words, say, give the first bet to the next player. Now, in some games, it's acceptable, socially acceptable, to check, and then when it comes back around to you, raise the bet. In other settings, it's not. Now, there's no formal rule in poker that says you can't do it, but there are informal institutions or informal rules that govern whether or not that's acceptable at that particular game or not. Okay? Well, that's the type of rule we're talking about. Some of them are formal. Some of them are informal. So, for example, 
what we mean by institutional structure that, that causes unemployment or structural unemployment is, well, basically anything that prevents the labor market from reaching equilibrium. So if we have our supply of labor here and our demand for labor here, we end up with equilibrium here, right? With L bar, going back to chapter 3, having L be fixed, um, amounts of labor, and at a real wage rate of W over P. Okay, so we have this equilibrium. Now, anything in the economy that prevents us from reaching that equilibrium will cause structural unemployment. So, for example, let's say we have a rigid wheel, real wage. Now, what could cause those rigidities? Well, several things, and give us, give us a second, that's the next slide. But, let's say for some reason, wages cannot fall below this line, this level. Well, then what's going to happen? Well, we have a price floor that's above equilibrium. When we have a price floor that's above equilibrium, what does that mean? We're going to have, well, a surplus. We have more labor than we have demand for that labor. And so, that's our amount hired. Our amount offered is supply. And so, if the real wage is stuck above equilibrium, then, well, we get unemployment. Because a surplus in the labor market is, is just unemployment. Okay, so here's the question. What can cause these real wage rigidities? Well, we're going to come up with three basic reasons. There could be more. There probably are more. Um, I'm going to add a fourth real quick. All right. Um, your psychology. All right, I'm going to abbreviate that. Psychology, okay, you've got it in your head what you think your labor is worth, and the market for your labor changed. And it takes a little while for you to update in your mind what your labor is worth. So we have, number one, minimum wage jobs. All right, minimum wage is clearly a price floor. It's our cl one of our classic examples of a price floor. And if that minimum wage is set above equilibrium, it's going to cause unemployment. Two, labor unions. Labor unions want to negotiate as high a wage for their workers as possible. That's kind of what they're there for. Well, if they end up negotiating a higher um, wage than what the individual's equilibrium is, and we can talk a little bit more about that. It's a little more micro theory than macro. But if they do, that can prevent wages from falling and can prevent wages from going down to equilibrium and will cause unemployment. And then finally, this efficiency wage. Now, the efficiency wage theory basically says, all right, if I'm a company and the going rate is, I don't know, say $8 an hour. Well, if I pay $8 an hour, I'm just going to get this pool, all right, this group of people that everybody gets. But what if I pay $10 an hour? Well, everybody's going to want to come to my company because everybody else is paying $8 an hour, and so I get to pick the very best out of that group. Right? So, the efficiency wage, I may decide to pay a wage that's a little bit above equilibrium. Why? Because I think I can get a better worker, and with a better worker, I get more productivity, and so I think overall it's cheaper for me just to pay a little bit more. Okay, so let's take a little look at the um, evidence on minimum wage. One of the issues with minimum wage is it generally does not affect most workers. Most workers who are um, earning minimum wage are not the primary income earners for their household. They're usually not even the secondary income earners for their household. They're usually a tertiary income earner or more. In other words, a lot of times they're teenagers and forgive me, sometimes college students, right, um, who are not the main breadwinner of, the, uh, of the, the house. Usually, most of the adult working um, population is making more than minimum wage. Now, I don't know whether that's because our minimum wage is too low or our wages are, are good, but that's, that's a fact. So, we look at this, we say, well, let's focus in on teenagers, to see if minimum wage has an effect on them because they're the ones that it's actually a binding price floor. 
Well, um, in some studies, a 10% increase in the minimum wage um, will um, increase. Oh, that there's a typo in there. So, 10% increase in minimum wage. Um, will this should be um, increase teen unemployment by one to three percent? All right. If we increase the minimum wage, we're going to increase teen unemployment. Makes sense. Why? Because we're creating this wage rigidity. All right, and and it's important to note minimum wage cannot explain the majority of the natural rate because most workers' wages are above that. So next, labor unions. So a union essentially is trying to use what's called collective bargaining. So another way of thinking about that is it's trying to bring everyone together, all the workers together, and instead of acting as individuals, they act as one monopoly. And they try to price themselves as if they were a monopoly over labor. Well, the problem with that is that that monopoly um, profit maximizing point or the, the optimal wage rate if there were a monopoly of labor is higher than the wage rate if all the workers were working individually. So there are workers who would be more than happy to work for below the um, wage that the union negotiates. And so, because of that, the union has negotiated a price floor that's preventing the um, price from coming down to real wage from coming down to equilibrium and thus causes unemployment. All right. So one of the things that we see in this is unions oftentimes have these, these insiders versus outsiders. The insiders are those who are actually in the union and have a job. They have an interest in keeping wages high. The outsiders are unemployed non-union workers. Now they'd really prefer lower wages. Why would they prefer lower wages? They'd prefer lower wages so there would be enough jobs. Right, right now there's not enough jobs to go around. Finally, the efficiency wage theory. So this is basically, I, I explain this, but it's pretty simple. I say, hey, look, I'm going to pay a higher wage. I'm, I'm, a, I'm the um, owner of a firm, and I'm paying a higher wage. Why? Because I think I can get higher quality job applicants, which means I can hire a better worker, which means I'll have lower turnover and um, overall more productivity. So if I pay uh, above the equilibrium wage, I say productivity goes up, and it goes up by enough that it's actually cheaper for me to pay a little bit more. All right, and I'm actually a big proponent of this efficiency wage thing. I when 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 I hire, I um, I'm also the director of the Center for Economic Research at University of Wisconsin at the College of Business and Economics in the University of Wisconsin River Falls, um, and I hire a student assistant. Well, I pay a little bit more than the average rate for a student assistant because, well, I want to hire the best. And of course, this results in structural unemployment. Why? Well, because it's preventing the um, wage from falling to the equilibrium level. Now, next, here is the departure where I'm going to make a departure from the textbook. And instead of putting sectoral shifts under frictional unemployment, I'm putting it under structural unemployment. So we'll talk a little bit more about why, but let's deal with the definition first. Changes in the composition of demand among industries and regions. That's what a sectoral shift is. OK, so we could see this in farming. Um, in 1913, farming was done primarily through manual labor. Uh, you had very few tractors. You had mostly, um, um, you used animals, either horses or oxen, to pull plows. And I mean, it was, it was very, very vastly different. Farms were much, much smaller. Um, they were more diversified. Uh, there was just a, a very different industry. Now, things have changed. We don't use draft horses anymore to plow our fields. We use really, really big honking tractors. So if you were in 1913, now let's say you're, you're a really old guy, right? In 1913, you built harness for draft horses for pulling 
pulling plows. Well, let's say now you're doing the same job in 2013. Well, the sector has changed. And you might build harnesses for um, plowing, but you're not going to build leather harnesses that are made to hook a horse up to a plow. You're going to build metal um, you're going to build metal harnesses, right? Metal hitches and tongues and, and um, parts, three-point hitches, all this stuff, so that you can hook a tractor up to a plow, right? And the skills are very different. It goes from leather working to steel working, from um, kind of this craft artisan work to engineering. Uh, it's, it's just a very vast change that you've seen in our, in, um, in the demand for labor within the agricultural sphere. And we can see this I across the board. Um, in the 1950s, typing was an important skill. All right? And typing meant you knew how to spell well. Because guess what? Typewriters didn't have spell check. You were accurate. Today, well, we just type on a computer. All right? and, oh, if we make a mistake, we go back and change it. All right, we spell something wrong. That's what spell check is for. But at the same time, that computer is a heck of a lot more complicated to operate than the um, typewriter was. So the types of skills needed have changed significantly over that time period. Why? Because of these sectoral shifts or structural changes in the economy, i.e., we've talked about so far, changes in technology. Um, there's also other changes that can happen, changes in regulation, changes in um, well, changes in um, tastes and preferences, um, changes in our knowledge. So, for example, in 1913, we didn't know that tobacco was bad for you. Today, we know tobacco is bad for you. So, there should be this sectoral shift away from the production of tobacco. So, we have some examples. We talked about this technological change. Another example, a new international trade agreement. All right, this is probably one of the biggest sources of sectoral shifts or structural change we see today. If you look at the United States and its progression, it started out essentially as a third world country. Um, and you can think of the United States back in the 1800s and the manufacturing sector in the 1800s is very similar to the the stage of production that say or the stage of development let's say well it's a, China's a little past that maybe but not too much but many of the developing countries who are producing all this stuff we see it's made in China made in Taiwan made in well Taiwan's quite a bit more developed um, uh, made in um, um, Indonesia there's these developing countries. Well, they're at about the same stage we were, say, in the 1800s. All right? They have very cheap labor, low skilled labor, and so these um, low skilled manufacturing type jobs are going to these areas. Now, that's not to say that manufacturing in the United States is, is ending or in any way in trouble. In fact, we produce more now than we ever have. And the United States actually produces, in terms of market value, more manufacturing goods than any other country in the world. All right, but you say, but wait a minute. Why are so many people losing their jobs in manufacturing? Because of these changes in technology and these sectoral shifts. So now that we have new international trade, the lower skilled jobs are going towards these places that have an abundance of low skilled labor. And the high skilled jobs are going towards the United States because we have an abundance of high skilled labor. And this really hits on this structural unemployment that the president of the Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis was trying to get at. Said that there's this mismatch between the available jobs and the workers who want to work. They don't have the skills needed for these basically very high-tech uh, manufacturing jobs. We don't need someone who can bolt a door on a car anymore. We need someone who can program a robot to bolt a car on a door. And it's a considerably more technical um, process now. Um, however, our uh, manufacturing workers make more because they're higher skilled. They're more productive. 
and we produce a lot of stuff. But we see these sectoral shifts happen um, in the United States that these lower paid, low skilled jobs are just leaving and we're developing more and more higher paid, high skilled jobs within the manufacturing sector. This is a huge amount of sectoral change in the um, United States. And in fact, you can see this worldwide when you look at China and China is actually starting to experience outsourcing itself. Right? They are starting to reach a level of development where workers are wanting a, a significantly higher wage than what they had before. Now, that's not higher by U.S. standards, all right? considerably lower than U.S. standards, but still higher than countries close to them, say Laos or Cambodia or Vietnam. And actually, production of some of these low-skilled manufacturing jobs are being outsourced from China into Southeast Asia. It's, it's really quite amazing to see how fast um, the world economy is really developing. So these sectors, according to your book, result in frictional unemployment. But I'm telling you, that's not frictional. It's structural. And the reason why it's structural is it's permanent. And it has nothing to do with the job search. Better information isn't going to make this any better. Uh, the only thing that will make this better is to retrain workers who have obsolete skills in skills that are in demand so that they will now match the jobs that are, are available. So here's some examples of structural shifts. The Industrial Revolution, huge structural shift. We moved from cottage industries to a manufacturing type economy. Uh, the energy crisis of the 1970s basically shifted demand away from large cars to small ones. Now, so what's the big deal with that? Well, there's two big deals. First of all, in the 1970s, uh, before the energy crisis, small cars were not cool. That's why when you look at, you know, your grandparents' car, it looks like a boat, right? They liked big cars. And the U.S., all right, the United States was really good at the time relative to the rest of the world at making big cars. Relative to the rest of the world, I think we're still pretty good at making big cars. I cite, i.e., the Hummer. Um, however, um, there were several foreign car makers, for example, Toyota, um, and the big one, all right, believe it or not, in the 60s and 70s was VW. All right, the Volkswagen Bug was a revolutionary car. It was a compact car that was actually acceptable to the American palate. And in other words, you know, it could go up the hill without going down to 40 miles. It had enough power. It would. It just ran well. It was really the first small car. The, the Bug, all right, the Vol VW Bug was just a revolutionary car and it came comes around right in time for this energy crisis and all of a sudden everybody wants small cars well the US the US had to retool to make small cars because generally what happens is you have a factory that makes one type of car you can't just spit out any kind of car from a factory because you have different tools, different stocks of inventory, um, different things for making the different shapes of different cars, right? So um, the fender on a Ford pickup is different than the fender on a Ford car, right? So they have to have the machines to make the, uh, make the different parts. And usually the factory is pretty specific to the model that it makes. Well, some of the foreign car makers, particularly VW, were already in position. They were already making little cars. The U.S. wasn't. And so the U.S. was a little bit behind. It took the U.S. a little while to, to catch up with um, some of these foreign car makers who were making little cars and had been making little cars for a while. Uh, and so, well, this is where the, um, really before 1970, the U.S. had very little competition. You know, um, all the foreign cars were, were not looked on as, as being high, very high quality. Um, and it was, you, you bought a U.S. car because it was better. Um, after the 1970s and after the energy crisis, and particularly after the VW bug, 
the um, that really changed and now we have a much much more international market for cars and we've seen the automotive industry in the United States has struggled even up to today to adjust to that new um, that new regime or that new structure of the economy having so much foreign competition um, healthcare major sectoral shifts in healthcare due largely to the population aging. All right, the population is aged. As our population ages, we demand more health care. So in our dynamic economy, smaller sectoral shifts occur frequently, contributing to, and sectoral shifts don't contribute to frictional unemployment. They contribute to structural unemployment because when we change the structure of the economy such that we don't demand these skills anymore, it's not a matter of searching for a new job. It's a matter of being reskilled, right? Learning new skills that allow you to find a new job. And that concludes Chapter 6 and our discussion of unemployment.